I don't think I can get rid of this because I don't have my mouse. So when I'm screen sharing, so one second. It's, correct answer because it's, already highlighted on correct it's not doing anything for some reason. Okay, one second. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for the introduction. So hi, everyone. I'm Alexandra. I'm a third year student at MIT. And I'm going to be telling you today about some new results on single server private information retrieval with sublinear amortized. And this is joint work with my advisor, Henry Corrigan Gibbs, and with Dima Kogan, and it appeared at your coach earlier this year. So Oh, can you all hear me or should I be speaking louder? Yeah. Okay, we're good. So to begin, let me explain the private information retrieval problem. In this problem, we have a server that holds an NBIT database, and we have a client come along that holds some index I between one and N. What our client wants to do is to privately read the I database bit. It can do so if it interacts with the server following a private information retrieval or PIR protocol. At the conclusion of this protocol, our client is going to learn exactly the I database bit, while our server is going to learn nothing about the index I that the client is reading. So a little more formally, our PIR scheme is going to be correct. If for any database held by the server and for any index held by the client, an honest client interacting with an honest server is going to correctly read the database bit that it's trying to learn. In addition, our PIR scheme is going to be secure if the server learns nothing about the index that the client is reading. So more formally, for any two indices, I and J, that our client could be reading, our server's view is going to be indistinguishable whether the client is making a query for I or making a query for J. So the very first PIR schemes were given in the setting where a client communicates with two non-colluding servers that each hold replicas of the database. However, Kushilevitz and Ostrovsky showed that from cryptographic assumptions, we can actually build PIR schemes where a client communicates with just one server. And this is going to be the setting that we're interested in in this talk. Other work has also shown that we can extend PIR to uh, be relevant for lots of realistic deployment scenarios. For example, the client can make queries to a database where the entries are longer than just a single bit, and the client can also make lookups by keyword rather than index. And a wide array of work has shown that if we use PIR as a building block, we can build lots of very compelling applications. For example, we can build a system for private media consumption, where our server would hold a set of movies or a set of news articles, and our client can fetch movies or news articles without revealing what it's interested in. Or we can build systems for privacy preserving advertising, private e-commerce, metadata hiding communication, just to name a few. So to date, there's been lots of work on making PIR as practical of a primitive as possible. And we know how to build PIR with relatively small communication costs. Specifically in the single server setting where we have our client communicate just one database server, we know how to build PIR where the communication spell, uh, scales polylogarithmically with the database size. However, PIR schemes have high server side computation costs and by Molishai and Malkin proved a lower bound that shows that this is in fact inherent. Namely, to answer even a single PIR query, our server needs to run in time linear in the database size. And intuitively, you can think of this as follows. If you have a server that answers a PIR query without touching any one location in the database, then the server learns that the client probably isn't reading that location. And so this would leak something about the client's query. 
And since we can't have any leakage at all, the server needs to do essentially a linear scan over the entire database. Fortunately, though, this isn't the end of the road because prior work has shown that we can hope to amortize this linear server time over many queries. In other words, in the many query setting, we can build PIR schemes where the amortized per query server work is sublinear in the database size n. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to survey the existing approaches to building this sublinear time PIR. So the first such approach is what we call batch PIR. In the setting, our client is going to make a batch of queries and send them all at once together to the server. Our server is going to answer all these queries together in time linear in the database size and send all the answers back to the client. So if we amortize over enough queries, the per query server time is sublinear in the database size. A second approach is what we call offline online PIR. In these schemes, our client communicates first with a server in an offline phase. And this offline phase requires linear server time. But after this, the client can communicate with two servers in an online phase for every query that it wants to make. And this online phase is going to require only sublinear server time. So again, if we amortize over enough queries, the total per query work is a uh, total per query server work is sublinear in the database size. A third approach is what we call PIR with preprocessing. In these schemes, the server runs a one-time preprocessing step during which it computes some encoding of the database. And then later on, the server can use this encoding to answer client's PIR queries in time sublinear in the database size n. And finally, a sort of trivial solution to the PIR problem is to just have the client download the entire database. So our server is going to pay a linear one-time cost to ship the whole database to the client, our client is going to store it locally and then answer its PIR queries on its own. So again, amortized over enough queries, the server work per query is sublinear in the database size. Unfortunately, each of these prior approaches come with some limitations that make them cumbersome to deploy in practice. So batch PIR requires the client to make its queries non-adaptively rather than slowly over time. Offline online PR requires the client to communicate with two non-colluding servers, which in practice requires careful coordination between multiple business entities, because the security now comes from the fact that an adversary can't corrupt both servers rather than from cryptographic hardness. The known approaches to PR with preprocessing in the single server setting require the server to produce an encoding of the base size that consists of roughly n bits for every client that it's communicating with, or they require virtual black box obfuscation. And finally, if the client downloads the database, then the client needs to store the whole database, which is impractical for large databases that are gigabytes or even terabytes in size. So at this point, the world of private information retrieval is in an undesirable state. We just saw that there are compelling applications, but we don't have any schemes that are easy and cheap. To deploy. I guess there's also PIM, the email side and now. Yeah, exactly. So that falls into the PIR with preprocessing setting, except with two servers. But yes, exactly. Well, I think we also have one server. Uh, and, and they don't have to start and with just like. Which which scheme is this? The PIM. Remote oh. side and now. This is the two server. Oh, maybe we can. Also have the one server. Maybe we can talk about this offline and be very curious to see the pointer again. Great. So what we do in this work is we give the first PR schemes that jointly achieve a number of properties that we care about in practice. Specifically, our client is going to communicate with only a single database server. Our client is going to be able to make its queries adaptively. There's going to be sublinear extra storage of any kind. Specifically, we're going to have some sublinear extra storage on the client and no extra storage on the server. And finally, and most importantly, our server is going to run in sublinear amortized time. So to give you a quick 
preview of our results, we're going to give a scheme from decision to be helmet in which our server runs in time enter the three fourths and our client and storage enter the three fourths. And then we're going to show that from the stronger assumption that fully homomorphic encryption exists, we can do better and we can build a scheme in which our server runs in time root n and our client has storage root n. In addition, we also give some new lower bounds on uh, multi-query PIR. And these lower bounds are going to relate the server time with the client storage. And these lower bounds are going to match our most efficient FHE-based construction. So they're going to show that this construction is, in fact, optimal when it comes to this trade-off. Great. So in the rest of this talk, I'd like to do the following. First, I'm going to give you some background on the specific types of PIR schemes that we construct. And then I'm going to walk you through our results. So our new PIR schemes with sublinear amortized server time, and then our new lower bounds on many query PIR. And finally, I'm going to leave you with some open questions in this area of work. And also, I want to say that feel free to stop me at any point with questions if anything's unclear. Great. So let's get started with the background. So in this work, our goal was to build PIR in which the client can make many adaptive queries and the server can run in sublinear amortized time. And so throughout this talk, I'm going to use Q to denote a bound on the number of adaptive queries that our client wants to make. Our approach is going to be to build PIR schemes that work in two phases. First, before the client has any idea of which database bits it wants to read, our client is going to run a one-time offline phase with the server. And this offline phase is going to require linear server time. And later on, for each of the Q adaptive indices that our client wants to read, our client is going to run an online phase with the server, requiring only sublinear server time. So now you can tell that if the number of queries Q that our client makes is large enough, namely if it's at least n to the epsilon for some constant epsilon, then this sort of scheme is going to give us sublinear amortized per query server time. And at this point, I'd also just like to make the distinction to related work clear, namely prior work on offline online PIR in the single server setting only lets the client make one query per offline phase. And so they cannot hope to achieve this sublinear amortized time. Great. So now let's look at the communication pattern of these schemes in a little more detail. So first, in an offline phase, our client is going to interact with the server to recover some hint about the database contents. Yeah. In the previous slide, yes. I guess there's work by Carbon, Gibson, Tobin, and my paper. I think we have to put unbounded number of queries. Yes, but I guess not in the single server setting. Oh, uh, we are talking about a single server setting. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but great point. Great. So our client is going to interact with the server in an offline phase to recover some hint about the database contents. And this hint is going to be small in that it's sublinear in the database size. And this offline interaction is going to require linear, linear server time. Later on, at some point, our client is going to decide that it wants to read some database index, say index I1. And so it's again going to interact with the server. So send a query, get back a response. And from this response in the hint, our client is going to be able to recover the I1 database bit. And this online phase is going to require now only sublinear server time. Again, later on, our client is going to decide that it now wants to read some other database bit, say index I2, and it can proceed exactly analogously to run another online phase with the server and recover database index I2. And this continues for Q queries. So you might wonder what happens if the client wants to make a Q plus one query. And at that point, the client can just run the whole scheme again. So run another offline phase, get a new hint, and this new hint is going to support Q additional queries. So the amortized costs of such a scheme when the client restarts are just going to be the same. Great. So what are the requirements on such a PIR scheme? Well, our requirements are twofold. First, we care about correctness. This says that if we have an honest client, 
interacting with an honest server, then for any database held by the server and for any queue adaptive queries made by the client, our client is going to correctly recover the database bits that it's trying to read with overwhelming probability. In addition, we care about security and more specifically, malicious security. This says that even we, if we have a malicious server that somehow deviates from the prescribed protocol, our server is going to learn nothing about the queue adaptive indices that the client is reading. So a little more formally, for any two adaptive query sequences I and I prime, our server's view is going to be computationally indistinguishable whether the client is making query sequence I or making query sequence I prime. And the way we protect against malicious servers is by ensuring that structurally in our schemes, the client's queries are always going to be independent of the server's past answers. So even by deviating from the protocol, a malicious server can learn nothing more than an honest but curious server could. And finally, given these two requirements, our goal is going to be to build PR schemes that minimize the overall cost. So we care about minimizing the communication between the client and the server, minimizing the computation, especially on the server side, and minimizing the storage, which in our schemes is only going to be on the client side. Great. So there are no questions. We're ready to start diving into some PIR schemes. And I'm going to start by giving you a more formal description of what exactly it is that we prove in this paper. So the first thing we show is that assumptions that imply linearly homomorphic encryption are enough to give us this sublinear time PIR. Specifically, we show that under the decision diffie helmet decision composite residuosity, quadratic residuosity, or learning with errors assumptions, we can build a single server PIR scheme such that on database size n, and if our client makes at least n to the one fourth adaptive queries, then our server is going to run an amortized time n to the three fourths, our client is going to have storage n to the three fourths, our server is going to have no extra storage, and the amortized client time and amortized communication are also going to be sublinear. And so this is a good point to note that in this theorem statement and also in the rest of this talk, I'm going to hide factors that are either logarithmic in the database size or polynomials in the security parameter. So at this point, we wondered whether we could do better, and we proved that from stronger assumptions, we can. Namely, assuming fully homomorphic encryption, we give a second single server PIR scheme in which the amortized server time is root n and the client storage is root n if the client makes at least root n adaptive queries. And there's an asterisk next to the FHE here because what we actually need is something we call gate by gate FHE, which just means that the homomorphic evaluation routine is efficient and standard FHE constructions satisfy this property. Great. So now I'd like to draw your attention to two things. First of all, in uh, theorem one here, the amortized server time is optimal for the given number of queries. Namely, uh, by Bimola, Shai, and Malkin's linear server time lower bound, for any PIR scheme that supports only n to the one fourth adaptive queries, we cannot hope to have amortized server time better than n to the three fourths. And the same is also true of theorem two, but for theorem two, we additionally prove something stronger. Namely, we give a new lower bound that shows that for theorem two, the trade-off between the amortized server time and the client storage is in fact optimal. And so now what I want to do is I want to give you a sketch of a construction that proves theorem one. Are there any questions before we dive into this? Cool. Yeah, I guess. Oh, I, yes. I'm confused about the so the the first law bound is proven by the CIM paper. I thought it is like you prove the product of the base and the yeah. server running time. So that, that's not a special case of what you prove. Um so here what I'm saying is that for any PR scheme in which the client makes n to the one fourth queries. We can't have server time better than n to the three fourths. 
by the VIM floor bound, the linear server time floor bound. Because it has nothing to do with the storage. No, nothing to do with the storage. Oh. Yeah, the only the second uh, second bound has something to do with the trade off between time and storage. Yeah, great point. Great. Okay, so let's prove theorem one. So to prove theorem one at a very high level, we're going to proceed as follows. We're going to start with the pre-existing result proved by my co-authors, namely that we can build single query PIR with sublinear online time. Then what we're going to do is we're going to give a new generic compiler that takes as input a single query PIR scheme and transforms it to output a many query PIR scheme for Q adaptive queries. And this compiler is going to apply ideas from batch codes, but crucially, unlike batch PIR, it's going to let the client make its queries adaptively. And so what we get when we take this pre-existing result and plug it into the compiler is we get out a many query PIR scheme with sublinear amortized time, which is exactly what we sought out to construct. So let's look at this pre-existing result. What my co-authors proved is that assuming DDH, QR, DCR, or LWE, we can build single query PIR that looks as follows. So first, in an offline phase, our client is going to interact with the server to generate some hint about the database contents. This hint is going to have size n to the two thirds, and the server is going to run an offline time n. Later on, at some point, our client is going to decide that it wants to read some database index, say index i, and so it's again going to interact with the server to recover the i database bit. And now this online interaction is going to require server time only n to the two thirds. And so you might wonder, wait, doesn't this already give us what we want? And the reason it doesn't is because it's single query. So the client can never reuse this hint to make a second query. This would break security. And so even though the online server time per query is sublinear, the total server time per query is still linear in the database size. So our job now is to compile the scheme in a way to support Q adaptive queries in sublinear time. We do this with the following idea. To handle Q adaptive queries, we're going to have the client send a permutation over the database indices to the server. Our server is going to apply this permutation to the database and then split the database into Q chunks, each of size n over Q. So now we observe that by a balls and bins style analysis, when our client makes Q adaptive queries with overwhelming probability, at most lambda distinct queries are going to fall in any one database chunk. In other words, for our purposes, it's going to be sufficient to build a scheme that lets the client read from each chunk adaptively up to lambda times. And we're going to do exactly this as follows. So in the offline phase, again, our client is going to send a permutation over the database to the server. Our server is going to permute and partition the database into Q chunks, each of size n over Q. And then our client and our server are going to run lambda offline phases of the underlying single query PIR scheme on each of the Q chunks. So our client is going to get back some answer from the server. And from this answer, it's going to recover lambda Q hints, namely lambda hints about the contents of each of the Q chunks. Okay, so now later on, our client decides that it wants to read some database index, say index I1. Well, the first thing our client can do is figure out which chunk it is that I1 falls into. Here, I1 falls into the middle chunk. And so our client can select out a hint that matches this middle chunk. So it'll pick this hint. And then our client can use this hint to build a query uh, for I1 exactly as in the underlying PR scheme. Oh, yeah, do you have a question? Go so ahead. Is the permutation hidden? No, so we're going to send this permutation in like in the clear to the server. So we're going to send, we're going to use a pseudo random permutation for to minimize communication. And so we're going to send the key for the pseudo random permutation to the server. 
So if you have less diagnosis presentation, things like us uh, more relevant to increase in the same bucket? Yeah, great question. So the reason why this is okay is because the security or the randomness of the permutation only comes up in our correctness argument, not in our security argument. So yeah, so a client can shoot itself in the foot by like breaking its own correctness and asking too many, wanting too many queries for the same bucket, but we can't break security. Yeah, great question. Okay, so our client wants index I1. It picks a hint that matches the chunk that I1 falls into, and then it can just use the underlying PR scheme and this hint to build a PR query for I1 and send it to the server. Now, our server got this PR query, and our server is going to answer this query with respect to each of the Q chunks. So our server sends Q answers back to the client. Now, our client knows that it's only trying to read the middle chunk, and so it can select out this middle answer here and use its middle hint to recover the IWANTS database bit exactly as in the underlying single query PR scheme. Now our client is also going to cache the I want database bit. So if it should ever want to read this index again, it can just use its locally cached value and make a dummy query. And finally, our client is going to throw away the hint that it just used because our PIR scheme is single query. So our client can never reuse this hint to make a second database query. Great. So now our client is happy. It knows database index I want. But later on, our client wants to read the database again, and it can proceed exactly analogously to run another online phase with the server. So again, our client is going to figure out which database chunk I2 falls into. Here it's the top chunk. Select out a hint that matches this chunk. Use the hint to build a query. Get back Q answers from the server, namely one answer with respect to each of the Q database chunk, and use the top answer in the top hint to recover the iTooth database bit. And finally, cache the iTooth database bit and throw away the hint that it just used. And finally, the client does the exact same thing when it wants to query for database index i3. So this completes the construction of the compiler. And I don't unfortunately have time to give you the full security uh, and correctness analysis. You can find them in the paper, but I'm going to give you some intuitive argument for why this works. So the reason this is correct is because the underlying PR scheme is correct. And because as we argued before, with overwhelming probability for any query sequence, our client is not going to read any one chunk more than lambda times. So with overwhelming probability for any query sequence, our client is not going to run out of fresh hints to use, and it can complete this construction exactly as desired. Our PR, our PR scheme is secure because intuitively the underlying PR scheme is secure. So the server learns nothing about which index the client is reading within each chunk, and the client's query does not leak which chunk it's interested in. And finally, the cost of this construction is dominated by the cost of running the underlying PR scheme lambda Q times each time on a database of size n over Q, because that's the size of these chunks. So what we can do now is we can take a value for Q. We'll take Q to be n to the one fourths. Then we can look at the performance of our input PR scheme. Think of running the scheme lambda Q times on databases of size n over q. And this is going to give us exactly the performance of our output PR scheme. And so if we go through the math, I'll spare you. But if we did go through the math, we would see that we just got a PR scheme in which the hint size is n to the 3 fourths. The offline time is n, and the online time is n to the 3 fourths. So here, if you have a uh, single query PR with sublinear time, of for example, your hint size is exactly square of n, your online time is square of n, then using this generic compiler, you can get better. Things. Yeah, then we would do better, exactly. Okay, so uh, to design a better scheme than this, you probably need a, uh, need a PR scheme that can support a single query and that's enough. And then you can use the compiler. Yeah, that would be sufficient. Yeah, that would be sufficient to give a better result 
we're going to see that we get the result from FHE in a different way, but you are completely right that we can use this exact same approach. Okay. Yes. So I guess you're, you're not saying anything about the communication overhead. Should I think of the communication overhead just the same as the online time? Um, yes, the communication overhead is not going to be any bigger than the online time. And I and think that, that was good. You it, that online. I think the upload is going to be smaller and the download is going to be the same, but I can look into the scheme in detail and get back to you on that. Right. And, uh, also, for the choice of Q, like which are the two not your time to balance here? Like, what's the intuition of this optimal Q? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, what we did to pick this Q is we wanted to balance the offline time and the online time. So, the offline time is you know, you think of the scheme, you take the offline time, you think of running it lambda two times on a database size of n over q, that's divided by q, and the online time is just going to be the online time of this scheme running it lambda two times on a database of size n over q. So we balanced these two, and then we minimized uh, the communication. That's how we picked this q. So in the paper, we also give a different choice of q in which if you don't minimize the communication, you get online time into the two thirds. Um, but the offline time is always end. Yeah. yeah, the offline time is always end. So why, why are you, the Q is not, has nothing, no effect on the offline time. Yeah, but the amortized time is N over Q plus the online time. So uh, in the paper, we say with a different choice of parameters, you can take Q to be N to the one thirds, and then you get a scheme with amortized server time N to the two thirds. So is not that really bad at yeah, except the online upload is the offline upload is linear. So the amortized offline communication is sublinear, but the online upload itself is linear. And so we prefer the setting of parameters, but either either works. Oh, are you tracking the oh the online time is not tracking the offline amortizing the offline cost to the online time? No, this is yeah, this is oh I think you're balancing n over q and the online time. Yep, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. In my mind that it's already yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, good, good point. Great. So if we do exactly what you say and we amortize, well, we see we have a scheme that supports n to the one fourth squares with this offline time and this online time. So this gives us exactly n to the three fourths online time. And so we just built a scheme with sublinear client storage. In sublinear server time, which is what we wanted. Great. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the proof of theorem one. And you might wonder whether we can prove theorem two in exactly the same way. And unfortunately, the answer is no. To prove theorem two, we give an entirely new PR scheme from scratch. And this is somewhat more involved. So I'm only going to leave you with the high level ideas of how this works. So at a very high level, to prove there are two, we prove the following two claims that I'm going to give informally. First, we prove that if our client has some prior knowledge about the parities of roughly Q random independent subsets of the database, that each of size N over Q, then this is sufficient for the client to be able to make Q adaptive queries, each with online time n over q. And so again, this is different from prior work because prior work shows that with this knowledge, our client can make one adaptive query. And we're showing that in fact, our client can make q adaptive queries. The second thing we do is we build a Boolean circuit for retrieving the parities of roughly q subsets of the database, each of size n over q, in roughly n gates. So this Boolean circuit is going to make use of sorting networks. And we use it as follows. In our offline phase, our server is going to run this Boolean circuit under FHE. Because our FHE scheme is gate by gate, and this Boolean circuit has roughly n gates, this is going to take quasi-linear time. And because our server runs the circuit under FHE, our server learns nothing about the computation that it's performing. However, at the end of this offline phase, our client is going to get exactly the prior knowledge that it needs by claim one to then make Q adaptive queries 
each with online time and overview. So in a little more detail, this looks as follows. In our offline phase, our client is going to sample roughly Q subsets of the database indices, each of size and over Q. And then our client is going to encrypt each of these subsets and send them to the server. Our server is going to run our Boolean circuit for the parity retrieval uh, under FHC and send the answer back to the client. And when the client decrypts, it's going to learn exactly the parity of the database bits indexed by each of these subsets. Okay, so later on, our client decides that it wants to read some database index I1. And so then it can do the following. First, our client is going to check if it holds some subset S that contains I1. This check is going to pass with overwhelming probability. And if it does, our client is going to flip a coin. And with good probability over this coin toss, our client is going to do two things. First, it's going to ask the server for the parity of the database of the subset S with I1 removed. So in the offline phase, the client already learned the parity of the database bits indexed by S. In the online phase, the client now learns the parity of S with I1 removed. And so this exactly lets the client learn the I1 database bit. And second, our client now needs to throw away S because it just sent S with I1 removed to the server in the clear. And so it can never reuse this S to make another query because the server has seen it now. And so this would break security. So our client throws away S, but it, when it does so, this changes the distribution of sets that it holds. Specifically, our client just picked a set conditioned on the fact that it contains I1 and threw it away. So all the other sets now become less likely to hold I1. So our client is now going to refresh the distribution of sets that it has to ensure that they all remain perfectly random. Okay. And if one of the two failure events occurs, namely if the client didn't have some set that contained I1, or if the coin toss told the client not to execute this branch, then the client is just going to build a random subset and send that to the server. So the set is going to look completely random. So you can see that with some good probability here, our client is going to recover the I1 database bit. So now what we can do is we can amplify this success probability by repeating the whole scheme lambda times. So now with overwhelming probability, at least one of these lambda trials is going to let the client recover the I1 database bit. And so now our PR scheme meets our correctness requirement. And in addition, our PR scheme is secure because in the offline phase, all the sets are encrypted. So the server learns nothing about the client sets. And in the online phase, the server gets what looks like a random subset of the database indices of size n over q minus one. So our server learns nothing about the index I want that the client is trying to read. By the way, I just want to point out that yep. I think we need to send a random subject subject to containing I1 because otherwise the distribution of the set can never equal to a random set because we want to run to subjects not containing I. Yeah, I wrote it like this because I put both of these conditions in the same line here. So I was uh, like coalescing like the what the client needs to do if this fails and if the client needs to do if this fails. But yeah, you can just go through the math and then like with some probability, the set is going to contain I1. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. And so now we can look at the performance of this scheme. So the client's hint is going to consist of exactly the bits uh, that are, are the parodies of the Q subsets of the database that the client retrieved. So the client storage is going to be on the order of Q bits. The server in the offline phase runs our set, uh, our circuit of, that consists of N gates under FHE. So the server offline time is order N. And in the online phase, our server gets a set of size N over Q minus one and needs to compute its parity. So the server online time is N over Q. And so from this, you can tell that the amortized server time is N over Q. And when we take Q to be root N, this exactly gives us a scheme with amortized server time root N and client storage root N. Great. Okay, great. So this is what I wanted to tell you about theorem two. 
And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our lower bounds. So again, I'm going to start by telling you what exactly it is that we do in this work. The first thing we do is we give a lower bound on many query PR schemes in which the client can make its queries adaptively. So specifically, we show that for any single server PR scheme in which the client makes its queries adaptively, the server stores the NBIT database in unmodified form, the client stores S bits between queries, and the server runs in amortized time T. It must be that the product of the client storage S and the server time T is at least N. So in other words, this bound rules out any PIR schemes with both small client storage and small server time. At this point, we wondered whether PIR schemes in which the client can make its queries in a batch, so non-adaptively, could do better. And so we proved a bound in that setting. So we showed that if the PIR scheme additionally lets the client make a batch of Q non-adaptive queries at once, then it must be that either the product of the client storage S and the server time T is at least N, or the product of the batch size Q and the server time T is at least N. So this second bound here rules out schemes with both small client storage, small server time, and also a small batch size. So just to put these lower bounds in the bigger picture, what the first bound here is doing is it's generalizing the BIM linear server time lower bound to include some client storage. And the second bound is additionally including some batch queries. And I'd also like to mention some related work on lower bounds on PIR, specifically on PIR with preprocessing. So in the PIR with preprocessing setting, our server is going to have B extra bits of storage and our client has no extra storage. So S is zero here. And so, by Malisha and Malkin proved that with any number of servers, it must be that the product of the server storage B and the server time T is at least N. And very recently, Persiano and Yeo strengthened this bound in the single server setting to show that if B is large enough, then actually the product of the server storage B and the server time T needs to be at least N log N. So since these bounds here deal with server storage instead of client storage, they're orthogonal to ours. Um, I want to ask that here you said uh, the server stores B extra bit. So basically, you still need to assume the server stores the original database in its original form, right? Um, yeah, so these, the B extra bits denote like the size of the database encoding, if you will. Yeah, so okay. in addition to the N bits of storage, we're letting the server have B bits that can depend in any way on the database. And with if that happens, then it must be that B times T is at least. So for example, if you have some encodings for your database mm -hmm. and it's stored there and you throw, you just throw the original database. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I That's think, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the B refer, I can get back to you, but I think the B refers to the size of the encoding. Like it doesn't okay. matter when, whether you throw out the original database. Right. Was well, I, I have a question? question. Like I guess you make more sense if you use the entire net of the like, otherwise it's very hard to interpret it exactly for the model. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can double check this, but I think so. Okay. So okay. So the main takeaways from these bounds are as follows. First, our uh, first lower bound here proves that our new adaptive PR scheme from FHE is optimal when it comes to the trade-off between client storage and server time, because we had client storage root n and server time root n, and so their product is indeed n. Our second lower bound here shows that if the client has some small storage, namely if the client storage is smaller than the batch size Q, then existing schemes for batch PIR have the optimal server time. However, if the client storage is large enough, namely if it's at least the batch size Q, then our new adaptive PIR has the optimal server time. So in a sense, we have shown that with enough client storage, query adaptivity in PIR can come for free. And for those of you who are curious, we proved theorem three with a reduction to single query PIR, and we proved theorem four with an incompressibility argument. So we show that any PIR scheme that beats this lower bound would give us a better than possible compression algorithm. 
Great. Um, so now I'd like to leave you with some open questions. What we saw in this talk is that adaptive single server PIR with both sublinear amortized server time and sublinear client storage is theoretically feasible. Unfortunately, our schemes are not quite concretely efficient enough for use in practice. And specifically, there are a few lambda and log n factors that I hid throughout this talk, and this sort of thing adds up very fast in practice. So there's still a lot of work left to be done to push PIR closer to practice. Um, there's also already been some follow-up work, as I'm sure you know, that improves the communication of our FHE-based scheme to be O of 1. And other questions that are still open are whether we can construct optimal schemes, so schemes that match our lower bounds from assumptions weaker than fully homomorphic encryption, and whether we can somehow circumvent our lower bounds by having the server encode the database. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and refer you to our paper for many more details on everything I told you about, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. What's your sense about the, the client running time you may have any lower about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what we do here is we improve the server's time at some expense to the client, right? And we showed that this is inherent when it comes to the client storage, but it's, yeah, it's really not clear when it comes to the client running time. Yeah, it, it would be very cool to do better in that regard. Yes. Is your best answer to the third question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yes, but I, if I could tell you why, then <laughs> it wouldn't be an open question. So, <laughs> yeah, it'd be very cool to sort of combine some like server side pre processing and client side pre processing. So, like, both have storage um, to do better than the existing states. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>